Thank you for coming. My name is Rita Glavin. I'm going to be moderating this panel, which is about uh, company cooperation and when company cooperation might go perhaps a little too far to the point that a court might consider you to be a government actor. Um, I am uh, head of the white collar practice along with my Considine at Seward and Kissel, a law firm in New York, um, and used to be at DOJ for many, many years uh, before going into private practice. We have a super panel today. I will start with uh, the gentleman on the end, the green tie, J.P. Cooney, who currently is head of the fraud and public corruption section at the U.S. Attorney's Office in D.C. Uh, before that, J.P. was at the public integrity section at Maine Justice, where he was doing public corruption cases around uh, the country. Next to J.P. is Mike Leota. Mike is a partner at Wilmer Hale in their white collar and government investigations uh, practice area. Before he was at Wilmer Hale, uh, he spent years with DOJ, first at the U.S. Attorney's Office in Maryland, and then on assignment to the White House uh, Counsel's Office during the Obama administration. Uh, and before he was at DOJ, he was at Williams and Conley. So Mike has a healthy view of being on the defense side with companies and individuals, and then also on the prosecution side. Next to Mike is Sandra Mosier who is a uh, new partner at Quinn Emanuel, co-chair of their white collar and investigations practice. Before she joined Quinn Emanuel last year, she had just left from uh, the DOJ fraud section where she was chief of the fraud section. Before she was chief of the fraud section, she spent a number of years in the trenches as an AUSA in New Jersey and working her way up to, to the top of the fraud section. Um, next to Sandra, we have Roger Fairfax, who is a former colleague of mine from the 1990s <laughs> at uh, the Public Integrity Section and DOJ uh, here in Washington, D.C., out of Maine Justice, doing corruption cases around the country like J.P. Cooney did. After Roger uh, served his years with the DOJ, he was at O'Melveny and Myers, and he is now at uh, GW Law School, where he's the founding director of the Crim Law and Policy Initiative at GW Law School. He's written extensively on criminal law issues, including the modern federal grand jury, and of interest to us is about the privatization of prosecution functions. And he's doing uh, some research in that area now. So great group of people to talk about. Uh, I don't know if it's changing times, but there's recent case law on um, government asking private actors to do extensive cooperation and whether that becomes attributable to the government uh, when people get indicted. So let me sort of set up the background here. For the last 20 years, it has been standard playbook that when a company has allegations of wrongdoing, either they find it on their own or DOJ or the SEC or another government agency finds out about it, they go through and they decide how bad this is and um, should we be cooperating? Oftentimes, co companies decide to do that. And the benefits of cooperation are tried and true, which means that the company can avoid indictment. They can avoid significant fines. They can potentially avoid having a corporate monitor sit at their building for two to three years that they get to pay for. So there's a lot of benefits to corporate cooperation. But part of the corporate cooperation under DOJ policy, although it's changed somewhat over the years, but the bottom line is DOJ policy requires companies to do a full investigation of what the wrongdoing was and then explain it to DOJ what the results were. What we've seen happen in the last year, which is why we thought about this panel, is that there have been a couple of cases where um, individuals who worked for companies that were cooperating, those individuals get charged criminally. And when they had been charged criminally, and there's one case that happened uh, four or five months ago, a decision in New York, the individuals who were charged said, wait a minute, when I met with company counsel, um, my statements were compelled, that I met with company counsel and I gave uh, statements because it was under threat of termination, and the reason this happened is because the company was cooperating <coughs> with DOJ, and DOJ wanted them to interview them, and therefore, when I met with DOJ, my when I met with company counsel, it was essentially a meeting with the DOJ. And there have been a couple of district courts that have reviewed this and felt that DOJ essentially outsourced their public uh, 
responsibility and had corporate counsel do investigating for them and therefore the actions of the company counsel become attributable to DOJ. And that carried ramifications because it could mean suppression of statements. It could mean such things as the company becomes uh, a part of the government for purposes of discovery. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, pros and cons of cooperation, the pitfalls. And we got uh, a really great group of people. So I'm gonna to turn to Mike Leota, who has written on this issue, to talk a little more in detail about how, how we got here with cooperation and, and when it becomes a bridge too far. Thanks much. Um, so th this issue will arise and sort of uh, bedevil us as defense attorneys conducting internal investigations in three principal areas. One is when we're doing an internal investigation, we're gonna be collecting, reviewing people's emails, we're gonna search their offices, we're gonna look through documents, and the people who might later be charged could claim that that search was a warrantless search in violation of the Fourth Amendment if we're acting on behalf of the government. We're gonna interview those people, and when we interview them, they're gonna know that if they don't talk to us, they get fired. And those people could later claim that that was a compelled statement in violation of the Fifth Amendment. And then the files that we collect and the documents that we keep, we think that they're protected by the attorney-client privilege. These are our investigative files, but the defendants will later claim that those documents are open to discovery as government documents in certain circumstances. And courts have wrestled with all three of these issues, and they haven't put together yet a coherent or uniform way of addressing the issue. There's really two different lines of reasoning that have led to different decisions in cases in California and cases in New York and across the country. Um, the first line of cases came out of a Supreme Court decision in 1971 of Coolidge versus New Hampshire, in which the police were at a gentleman's home. They suspected him of, of a homicide, and his wife came out, made some statements, and gave the police guns that belonged to her husband. And when he was prosecuted for murder, he claimed that the wife handing over his firearms was a search and that it was attributable to the police and it should be suppressed under the Fourth Amendment. And the Supreme Court laid out a test, which they called the <coughs> instrument and agent test. And that's become one of the tests that's used in all three of these contexts. And the question is really, did the police coerce the private individual to conduct the search? Did the individual act as an instrument or agent of law enforcement when they took the particular private investigative steps? That case was followed in 1982 by a Ninth Circuit case, which spun out a little bit more what it meant to be an instrument or agent of the police. And it's been followed by at least seven different courts of appeals in this Fourth Amendment context, where you as a lawyer might do a search uh, and somebody might say, ah, oh, you were acting on behalf of the government. But in the Fifth Amendment context, this, uh, there were cases that arose under the Due Process Clause of the Fifth Amendment in which the Supreme Court seemed to be addressing the same issue but imposed a different test. That began in 1974 in a Supreme Court case of Jackson versus Metropolitan Edison. And at that point, it wasn't a criminal matter. It was a woman whose, whose electricity had been cut off. She claimed that the, when the utility cut off her electricity, they were essentially the state they had a monopoly and nobody else gives you electricity except the government. And the Supreme Court set forth a test called the sufficiently close nexus test. And did they have a sufficiently close nexus to being the government? Were they supplying a service that seemed like they were the government? Were they doing something that it's fair to attribute to the government? That was a Fifth Amendment due process case, but it's been carried forward to Fifth Amendment self-incrimination cases. And so when these recent cases arose in New York, in California and elsewhere, in which people were giving statements to attorneys that were doing internal investigations, a question, the, and the people claimed, oh, that person was acting on behalf of the government, they were cooperating. Uh, the question arises, like, what's the test? How do we even measure that? You have to know what the test is so you know what you as lawyers should do to avoid tripping over it. And in a case, that, a very famous case out of the Southern District of New York in 2006, KPMG, hired a law firm, Skadden, to do an internal investigation. And the court ended up finding that for one reason or another, Skadden and KPMG had been pressured to act on behalf of the government. And they applied this sufficiently close nexus test. And they uh, considered whether to suppress statements that individuals had made 
in that circumstance, there was eventually found to be no violation. But the lawyers were found to have been acting on behalf of the government. Other side of the country, in, um, in 2012, in United States versus Carson, the Central District of California applied the other test, the, um, the, the uh, instrument and agent test, to essentially the same conduct. There it was an FCPA matter, controls, components, incorporated. Uh, it was step toe instead of scadden, but essentially the same thing happened and the court found that the private lawyers were not instruments or agents. And in the Fourth Circuit had a case, similar case, Day, which also applied the instrument or agent test. And so not knowing exactly what the standard is um, can have a real implication. In the New York case, Stein, once the court found that the law firm was an instrument or agent of the government, the defendants then moved for discovery. They wanted access to the KPMG's files that KPMG had collected through Skadden during its internal investigation through Rule 16 discovery, and the court granted that motion. And on the other side of the country in California, the defendants in Carson wanted access to the files that Steptoe had, had gathered, and there, under Rule 16, the court denied the motion. And so it's important to know what the parameters are, what the two tests are, when you're conducting these internal investigations so that you know like where you have to avoid the line so that your files don't end up being the government's files that are open in discovery. And then the re there are some recent cases that um, my, Sandra, my, uh, my co-panelist, will tell you about because she had a sort of a bird's eye view to them. Sure. And that, I just learned a lot, actually, during that overview. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, the, the, yeah, there are a couple of cases uh, that have gone on in the past few years. And um, as Rita indicated in her kind introduction, over the course of the last couple of years, I've straddled both now the defense side as well as uh, the government side, and, and particularly at the fraud section, which was tasked with prosecuting a couple of the cases that we'll talk about today that implicate um, constitutional rights of a defendant in sort of what I would say, you know, non-traditional contexts, not, um, you know, traditional constitutional rights, but that arose in, in ways that were somewhat novel and were embraced, I think, um, uh, in ways uh, by the courts in some respects, uh, in ways that were somewhat novel. And so, I say in, you know, as a in full transparency, I was at the fraud section when these cases were being prosecuted. And so um, I, I, I'm wearing sort of two hats in, in um, offering a background on them and sort of where, where we stand today and, and, and what it means for internal investigations and cooperation. But the first one, which does involve um, the Fifth Amendment and uh, Garrity and sort of extending state action in some of the ways that that Mike was talking about in, in more historic cases was one um, out of the Southern District of New York involving prosecution of a couple of traders related to the LIBOR in, uh, scandal that went on over the past number of years. And these particular individuals worked at Deutsche Bank um, and what may or may not be well known is that the LIBOR cases really started with the CFTC uh, and then DOJ became involved sometime after that. And, and that's significant here because even though ultimately there was a trial that the criminal prosecutors at the fraud section brought against a couple of these Deutsche Bank traders in which all of this arose, a large part of what Judge McMahon in the SDNY ended up evaluating was the conduct years and years before of the first agency sort of on the ground to deal with counsel, which was Paul Weiss for Deutsche Bank in the LIBOR investigation. And um, so what, what the defendants, um, or what one of the defendants in, particularly, in particular alleged in that case or raised in the context of his criminal trial was that his Fifth Amendment rights had been violated because when Paul Weiss, counsel for the bank, interviewed him while he was still an employee, um, you know, his argument was that the actions of Paul Weiss were fairly attributable to the government because it had been the government, so the argument went, that had really been the architect of what Paul Weiss's internal investigation should look like and what, what the bank's internal investigation really should look like. 
who they should speak to, the order in which they should speak to, what they should speak to them about. And so Judge McMahon held an evidentiary hearing on this point um, leading up to the trial and ultimately um, reserved, saw some issues with it, and the government during the course of the trial um, maybe sensing which way the wind was blowing. I was there, so I can't talk too much inside baseball about it, but the decision was made not to actually introduce this individual defendant's statements, and it sort of obviated the issue at the time, but certainly in post-trial motions, this issue was raised as to whether it warranted vacating, pardon me, the entire conviction. And um, Judge McMahon um, ultimately denied the defendant's relief in, in um, those motions, but she really bit down pretty hard on the, the motion itself and um, was very critical of some of the actions that the government had undertaken based upon the evidence that she had seen um, and that had been presented to her in the evidentiary hearing and in, in a lot of briefing. And that included some of those very initial steps that I mentioned before um, that came from the CFTC, really a sort of directive about how to do things. Uh, she also um, ended up looking into and looking behind communications that the actual prosecutors from DOJ had with um, the uh, attorneys at, at Paul Weiss who were conducting the internal investigation. And um, she, the judge, you know, exerted and quoted some of those and, and felt like they were really sort of directives and that there was not enough independence um, displayed by the bank itself in conducting the internal investigation and um, that the actions could be fairly attributable. So that's... So, that's Sandra, I want to ask sure. you about that too, because in that, some of the specifics in that particular case, it's United States versus Conley, and the decision came out in May of this year. Yep. But a couple of the, the um, facts that were persuasive to Judge McMahon mm -hmm. um, were the fact that there was a the investigation done by outside counsel was a five-year internal investigation. And one of the questions she was posing to, to the government, and it was to both DOJ as well as the CFTC, the civil enforcement arm, because they had been involved in the beginning for some lengthy period of time before DOJ got involved. But one of the questions she posed was, well, what was the government doing in these five years? Paul Weiss is out there. They're the ones doing these interviews. They're the ones collecting evidence. And then in real time, they're giving reports to either the CFTC or DOJ. The CFTC at the start of this told Paul Weiss, come up with an investigative plan and then you need to run it by us and we'll work through it. We want to know who you're interviewing. You need to get permission from us first to do these uh, interviews. And uh, she noted the number of contacts with DOJ or the mm -hmm. CFTC over <clears throat> the five years, which was something like 250, at least, you know, phone conversations or 30 in-person meetings. And her view was that um, not only had the lines become blurred, but that the government was essentially sitting back and letting Paul Weiss do the work it was supposed to, that the government wasn't really interviewing employees, they were waiting on you know, Paul Weiss to do it. Right. A lot of that stuff historically has been what is standard playbook cooperation for, for companies. And so if you could give just a little feedback on how interacting, DOJ picks this up after the CFTC, who is a civil government investigator, um, who's not going to live with the ramifications of a criminal trial. Thank you for saying that. Um, uh, or, or, the, or the opinion, or the criticism. Or, or the, yeah, yes, but sort of so Some of the criticism, going, going into that, because she ends up having a hearing, because right. the defense makes the motion. She ends up saying, look, I need to hear more about this. I want to put, you know, you're going to have government, you're going to have to call the lawyers to the stand. I want it for me to decide if the actions of outside counsel are fairly attributable to DOJ, I need to have a hearing on it. And sort of just speaking from the perspective of DOJ at the time, was it unusual? You know, was DOJ very surprised that this was going on? Uh, well, so uh, look, there's a lot, um, if I hadn't been there at the time or been, and, and, and really in full transparency before, uh, when these motions or the evidentiary hearing and the trial were ha happening, I was, um, the acting chief of the fraud section. But 
in years before that, I was on the team uh, for Deutsche Bank at, at one point. And so on the one hand, I can say, and I, there's nothing I think, you know, uh, out, out of turn about this. I know I personally flew to a number of locations around the world to interview people. So it, it, there's, um, uh, there's the the hindsight of five years um, and the tallying up of you know the amalgamation of contacts and meetings and phone calls and emails that might occur over five years and sadly unfortunately sometimes investigations take that long for for lots of different reasons and I'm not saying that's a good thing that was just a reality there and I think Deutsche Bank was the last of all of the banks in LIBOR to reach some sort of resolution but there there certainly was. Um, an investigation going on, an affirmative investigation going on <clears throat> by the department at that time. I know that's not sort of on all fours with your question, but I, I think that that's important because I, 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 you know, the impression that the the practice or policy at the fraud section or DOJ, you know in terms of corporate investigations, because of course at fraud, we work with offices all across the country. So we know their practices as well, or I did when I was there, you know, that it was just really this total laid, lay back, sit back, passive receipt of information is just not accurate. But when you are in the business, in the department, um, if your job is to really only do cross-border work and international work, there are challenges that are very different because you cannot just go do a knock and talk. You cannot just serve a subpoena. You cannot just throw people into the grand jury in the way in the typical law enforcement tools. And so there is more of a, what should not be a total reliance, but in some aspects it is on uh, in, an internal investigation or the company, the bank, if they are cooperating to help facilitate. Now, that doesn't explain all of the evidence um, or, or the, you know, the actions or conduct that Judge McMahon might have found troubling in um, in the Connolly and Black case. But, you know, I think there are also a lot of lessons to be learned from that. And, and I, I don't think, you know, even when DOJ got involved, and knew the CFTC had been involved. I know it's not really on our agenda for today, but you know, by the way, there was another major Fifth Amendment case in the LIBOR scandal <laughs> that came out of it, Allen versus Conti, which was even more complicated in other ways, in which um, you know, someone's one of the LIBOR defendants' Fifth Amendment rights were implicated because of an interview that a foreign counterpart had done. The Financial Con Conduct Authority, which is sort of not akin to the CFTC, but both essentially civil regulators. FCA has a little bit of criminal authority, but I was also involved in, in that matter um, to some extent. And there were so many proactive things that I think the department was sort of, I commend at the time us and, and now them for thinking ahead, not realizing what could happen to try to shield itself from any potential taint issues involved in that respect. And so, um, one of those things was not to get in the CFTC's business every day because they had an agreement by which they could share information with the Financial Conduct Authority, whereas the Financial Conduct Authority could taint potential witnesses that the department wanted to use in a criminal case in America where there's a Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. It's, it's a quite becomes quite a vortex or a, a rabbit hole. And so when the DOJ, I think, came in, you know, they're not asking the CFTC, what, what, what's everything you said to Paul Weiss? How did you do this? Did you handle it the right way? And whether, I'm not saying it was right or wrong, obviously Judge McMahon had her opinions, but you know, what exactly did you tell them? We weren't, we were trying to maintain sort of separate lines for all of the reasons that you must do that with the CFTC and SEC and a parallel investigation. So there's so many different, um, potential blind spots that I think at the time the department was really thinking proactively about and trying to to protect against all of those things. And of course, it doesn't always work. And there are great defense attorneys that are raising, um, you know, really tough motions. And, and these are, are are some of them. So that was a little rambling. I'm sorry. I don't know no, if that answered no, your particular question. So, but. so on Conley, I mean, I think the issue was defense counsel moved to suppress their client statements made to company counsel. In the second case, which was notable, um, which is where Sandra had to live through this, but it's called the Converge X case, and this came out of New Jersey. And incidentally, it was the same defense lawyer as the lawyer in the Black and Conley case, the Deutsche Bank case, raising the issue. 
the motion he filed was to um, compel the government to go through the files of the cooperating company uh, for Brady purposes. Uh, it was a motion to compel the DOJ to say, you've got to search through company files because of the extent of their cooperation. And the judge in Converge X decided to hold a hearing because he wanted to know what was the extent of the cooperation between the company and DOJ, such that for discovery purposes, the company's actions and the company's files essentially are in the custody and control of DOJ. So there was a hearing in that case, and it's the situation no one particularly likes being in, where I think prosecutors' notes of meetings with company counsel were turned over. There was um, the counsel for the company, at least one or two of them testified. Um, and just uh, how this ended was before the judge rendered a decision about whether or not DOJ was going to be responsible for any potential Brady information in the files of the company, there was a uh, plea resolution, um, which was very favorable to that particular individual defendant. So that sort of sets the stage here. I signed it. <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> so, it's, so was the was the plea done to avoid what was potentially an adverse decision? Well, it, like in in any case, you're going to evaluate the the litigation risks. Um, sure. And it's interesting. I mean, I definitely we could have had. Judge Linares, who, I mean, I was a prosecutor in New Jersey, and so it was sort of just a co coincidence and I ironic that it ended up in front of Judge Linares, who I had tried a number of cases um, in front of when I was in AUSA. But I, it bears noting that Judge Linares is now a defense attorney. He has oh, really? stepped down from the bench. He was the chief judge there and returned to private practice. And so I have run into him and... Um, you know, I, I think I know actually sort of which way the the wind was blowing there, which way he would have gone, which I I then and now, despite now being on the defense side, don't find sort of persuasive. But um, but look, the implications of the, the hearing was held, you know, a lot of the things that you already covered, Rita, were sort of painful enough about it. But the the if you look at the scale of the, the potential implications for and there's a lot of interesting like sub issues, but potential implications for that court, even one court saying that if a corporate, if a company that is under um, some sort of investigation decides to cooperate with the government, you know, whatever that means, good cooperation, not the best, whatever, and engage in some sort of resolution, um, which will, by definition, certainly if it's with the, with the fraud section, and I'm sure if it's with D.C. And, and the other U.S. attorney's office, contain a cooperation component by which you, you know, must not breach for a period of time and continue to cooperate with, with the government and other potentially related investigations. Um, that any time a company elects to do that and to settle rather than potentially be indicted and go to trial, that if individual employees are later than prosecuted, no matter how large the company, no matter what the global footprint of it might be, that it is somehow then part of the prosecution team and that it is then obligated and the government is that is prosecuting individual wrongdoers is then obligated to go into every office across the world. I mean, imagine if this is GE or, you know, some massive company and, and, and look for or figure out a way to satisfy itself that it has received all exculpatory information as to one individual. I mean, it it was, I, I remember at the time always, I, I remember reading a case when I had been in AUSA and I was very, I think, frustrated to find that, that the, the, the Bureau of Prisons, which is part of the DOJ in case law is not considered to be part of the prosecution team in instances where you're getting jailhouse calls or, or, or things like, you know, there's some sort of undercover investigation going on. But yet a company that is the target of a criminal investigation that chooses to cooperate and resolves, even if they don't even like the resolution that they get, um, which I think was arguably the case in ConvergeX, that they are now part of the government's prosecution team um, was a bridge too far, I think, for, for at least to my mind when I was on the, on the government side. And I think 
the same sentiment was shared by the white collar bar, <laughs> frankly, um, in, in some respects. I mean, it depends if you're representing the individual or the company. And so That's I don't mean to paint client. it. Yeah, of course. And I don't That's mean to paint client. it as something simple, but you know, in the simplest of terms, that was the potential results. And that was it didn't really seem, you know, tenable as a sort of precedent going forward for really any any of the the players involved in in the entire sort of white collar criminal process. So Roger, you have done some writing and I think are doing some work now on the issue of the government outsourcing, whether it be the state government, local governments, the federal government outsourcing the prosecution function or law enforcement function. You want to talk a little bit about that? What's uh, your views upon that, the pros, the cons? Sure. And, and first, I want to thank you, Rita and, and Mike, for inviting me to uh, be a part of this. And also want to thank the, uh, the hardworking criminal justice section staff who always make this event run smoothly. And having served on the section council, and I see some of my um, uh, former colleagues on the council here in the room, um, uh, it is very important to have such a professional and well-organized um, staff. So, so thanks for that. When, when you asked me to be the academic uh, on this panel, um, I, I was excited. Um, um, when I learned the topic, because um, it is rare in academia, um, and I see a fellow law professor here in the room, um, uh, to have your academic work dovetail with uh, such a, uh, a concrete on the ground uh, practice issue like the one uh, we're discussing um, today. And I just so happened to be uh, doing um, uh, some work, a continuation of uh, my past work on the private role in criminal justice in my current project, tentatively titled Outsourcing White Collar Enforcement, obviously <laughs> fits. Subtle. Right? That's subtle, <laughs> subtle. Um, uh, fits well with um, uh, with this panel. Um, the bottom line is, uh, um, you know, this is nothing new, the private role in um, uh, criminal uh, justice. Um, you know, I've written on outsourcing of um, uh, the prosecution function, private prosecutors, um, something that happens um, uh, with alarming frequency around the country. Um, and of course, there's a, a, a body of literature on private policing and private prisons and other aspects of, of the private role um, in criminal uh, justice. And the, the private role in white collar enforcement uh, has been pronounced in recent days. Decades, you know, I think the profession um, has taken uh, note, and for for decades now, there's been what I call a force multiplier um, uh, effect, where the government um, has relied on. Um, private attorneys um, to assist it in investigating and, and rooting out wrongdoing, particularly um, in the corporate um, uh, realm. But uh, the primary focus of uh, our study of this issue has uh, been on um, the, the issue of how the private role um, in that investigation affects the substantive interest of uh, the client vis-a-vis -vis third parties. You know, in, in other words, uh, whether uh, the ultimate disclosure of uh, the uh, fruits of that investigation to the government will waive attorney-client privilege for purposes of uh, claims that third parties may want to bring um, uh, against uh, the corporation. And in here, um, we are dealing with a uh, scenario and a context uh, in which um, uh, courts are uh, opening up to the possibility uh, that these private lawyers conducting these investigations should be considered state actors. Um, and um, that has profound implications, you know, as, as uh, we've um, discussed, um, you know, for uh, the uh, provision of constitutional rights and, and, um, and then also from a regulatory design and policy standpoint um, uh, as well. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, uh, I look forward to um, uh, this discussion um, for a number of uh, reasons, and in part because it helps to uh, drive um, uh, my, my research agenda and the insights um, that I've gained thus far, um, you know, I think will we'll help in that regard. But when you really think about the constitutional implications of um, having a private law firm conducting an internal investigation and be considered a state actor. Um, if you think about due process issues, uh, you know, Brady, as we alluded to um, uh, earlier, you know, discovery rights, the privilege against self-incrimination, prosecutorial uh, misconduct more generally, right? If in fact, 
these uh, lawyers on the ground, these private lawyers on the ground are deemed to be state actors, um, I think we have to widen the scope of our inquiry uh, with regard to uh, the fairness of the process that is due um, a um, particular individual um, defendant. And so um, lots of very interesting questions and they all, uh, you know, many of them focus on the rights of the individuals who are being interviewed in these investigations, but um, some of the questions focus on the obligations of those uh, individuals. We, we've had some cases in recent years where um, courts have determined um, uh, or have at least explored the question of whether um, uh, someone lying to a law firm associate, let's say conducting an interview as part of an internal investigation, um, uh, should be considered a lie to a government official for purposes of obstruction of justice or 1001 false statements. And um, lots of, again, very interesting, knotty issues um, that um, are created um, in in this, um, in this realm where we're considering uh, the, uh, the work of these private lawyers in the internal investigation um, context to be uh, state action. And I look forward to our discussion of some of the more practical um, advice that I think we can offer practitioners um, on both sides, both in the government and on the defense side, representing both companies and then also individuals, um, uh, given this potential new reality. So, JP, now, as chief of the fraud and corruption se section at the D.C. Attorney's Office, you now are faced with the reality that uh, d defense counsel, able defense counsel, is going to scrutinize in internal investigations. They are going to scrutinize what the relationship was between outside counsel for the company and DOJ in terms of cooperation. And not just the relationship with DOJ, but also if you have a civil counterpart who's investigating at the same time, whether it be the SEC, the CFTC, the uh, you know FTC. And so the question for you is, what are you guys going to do? And I say that particularly in cases where you have investigations, let's say it's conduct that happened entirely abroad, and you're not going to be able to get the access to perhaps the documents or the individual employees for various you know, reasons. What is DOJ gonna do such that you know you're gonna be living with defense motions where potentially employee statements can be suppressed, defense motions that say, hey, the cooperation was so close with DOJ that um, DOJ now for purposes of Rule 16 and Brady and Giglio have to get me what's, what I want at company uh, company record room? So uh, I think um, the, the harsh reality, I think, for prosecutors and on the defense side, too, is I don't exactly know because, uh, I mean, I have a few thoughts on the matter. I don't mean to suggest that. But, um, but we don't have a clearly articulated set of legal principles to follow. Right? I mean, some of this is just like a field test. Like, we know what the potential pitfalls are. We know what the potential consequences are. But it's not altogether clear how to safeguard ourselves from them. So I, I think the biggest piece of advice uh, or the biggest kind of principle that I bring into this from a prosecution perspective, but I think it should be shared uh, from the corporate counsel perspective is moving in eyes wide open about what the potential consequences are. So what does that mean, particularly in a cross-border investigation is we know going in that we are going to accept some litigation risk. And there are some decisions that we're going to be that we are going to need to make about the type of evidence that we actually want to collect, that we feel we need to collect, and how far down the line we are going to be willing to go to get it. Because I think, as Sandra said before, the reality in those investigations of conduct that occurred predominantly or completely abroad is we do not have the traditional law enforcement tools to obtain them. And so the reality is we are going to be relying on. Uh, corporations who are coming to the department, coming to the U.S. Attorney's Office, seeking cooperation credit and seeking to turn over uh, the information we're looking for. And so what do we do to try and shield ourselves from that litigation risk, I think, are a few things. Is, um, uh, for starters, when we move into an investigation, understanding uh, how the investigation began and who was involved is very important. And so I think a new reality post uh, a case like Connolly is that 
we do have to, we have uh, principles trying to shield ourselves from other government entities like CFTC, like SEC, but I think the reality is, is that we are going to be doing more to understand the communications between those type of governmental regulatory bodies and uh, the corporations and their counsel to understand how those investigations unfolded and understand where the fruits of that investigation uh, were obtained so that we can make an informed decision about what information to collect. Second, I just think that um, the a big lesson from uh, these cases and from the the world we are going to be operating in is that record keeping is, is really critical. And so I think it is uh, just critical for the government to understand um, when we get into a case, what steps have already been taken, what, in, what evidence has already been collected, what are the sources of that, not from a substantive perspective, but from a process perspective, and understand when we come in and be able to document what information and what evidence we collect independent of any cooperation from a corporation, any communication with corporate counsel or anything like that. Um, and then the final thing, and I apologize if this is a little uh, windy, I should probably try and organize a little bit more, but I think that um, it's really, uh, we have an incentive as prosecutors. I know that the, the perception is that when we walk in that uh, the perception I think from corporate counsel sometime or the perception from the world is we just want everything, we want it quickly, we want it on a silver platter, we don't really care how anybody gets it. Um, and that is, that is certainly not the case. Uh, one thing I would ask of a, um, and have asked of uh, corporate counsel that I'm dealing with is, look, um, when we deconflict and you go out and conduct your interviews and things like that, take, take good mind of how you go about conducting them and how you go about memorializing them. I think knowing that I could be tagged with uh, potentially, and hopefully not, but the discovery of uh, a large corporation I think it's important that corporate counsel be thinking about the same thing that I think FBI agents and other law enforcement agents think about when they take notes. We tell FBI agents all the time, when you take notes, take notes on what a witness says. If you develop investigative ideas or other work product in the course of that interview, write that down somewhere else. Separate that out from what you're memorializing about the evidence you're taking and then the strategic steps that you wanna take in your investigation. It may very well be that at some point all these things could become discoverable, but at least if we have these things separated, we understand what exists on a factual uh, basis and what exists on a work product basis. And we also understand when that was taken and under what circumstances it was taken. So um, I, I, I tend to think that that, unfortunately, in answer to your question, Rita, it's kind of obvious advice. Um, but the problem is, is that it's born of understanding that there is risk for the government and also risk for a cooperating corporation that doesn't want its files necessarily to be opened up down the road or to be accused later on by the government of not having been, not having cooperated fully because of the manner in which it conducted its internal investigation. Um, but uh, it's kind of broad advice and generic advice because I don't think we have a really well articulated set of principles from which to draw clear lines about what might be considered state action and what might not be considered state action. Instead, I think we know what the risks and pitfalls are. So JP, the DOJ principles of corporate prosecution, which every defense lawyer you know, pours over whenever there is even a two word change, but it has remained largely the same, which is that for a company to get cooperation credit, they are expected to do a full internal investigation report to DOJ the results of the investigation, provide DOJ with any records that DOJ wants, and uh, what has become very much a focus in the last three years, four years, has been the requirement that the company has to identify for DOJ the individuals that were substantially involved in the misconduct, which necessarily means you're gonna be doing uh, company counsel is going to be doing interviews of employees, and they're going to be turning around and providing that information to DOJ. Does cooperation mean the same? What do you expect in light of 
these recent cases, what do you expect for a company to be fully cooperating? Uh, yes, it, it means it means the same. Uh, I think that um, uh, though, in addition to that, I, I make two observations. Is first, I think that these um, so much of this is fact dependent, right? Uh, so. You could imagine yourself, and I'm sure this is Roger, probably one of the areas you're particularly interested mm -hmm. in. When a, when a corporation is essentially opening its files to the government and saying, in an effort to identify the substantial participants in potential criminal activity, those substantially involved, identifying the evidence against those people, we all know and go into this eyes wide open that when a when corporate counsel is conducting these investi uh, investigations or conducting these interviews, they are doing so under the threat of, of termination for not participating. Um, uh, we, we can't run away from that. I think what is so important is uh, a collaboration, not towards state action, but communication between the corporation and the government to understand at what stage the government is coming into this investigation and having a clear demarcation of that, such that if, if we're coming in because the corporation has called us to say, hey, we are self-reporting, and we have already conducted a substantial investigation. There may still be pieces that we're putting together, but we're coming to you with this information. That's, that's really easy, right? Because the government is learning about it for the first time from the corporation. But when the government has, is going to the corporation and saying, hey, uh, we're serving you with a grand jury subpoena, for instance, we're conducting this investigation, we're looking for your full cooperation. I think at that point, um, the expectations are the same, but the topics of conversation need about the way in which an internal investigation is going to be conducted and the lines that are going to be drawn between the government and corporate counsel are really important to have on the front end. And the easiest example of that is my expectation is uh, of the prosecutors who work with me in my section. And, and to Sandra's credit, uh, we've learned a lot of this from fraud and from you know, doing work with the FCPA unit is having you know, clear conversations with corporate counsel about deconfliction. I mean, that's an area that I think is very well protected and that we still, um, that we still believe to be you know, a, a cornerstone of corporate uh, um, cooperation, which is we're not going to tell you who to interview. We're not going to tell you how to conduct your investigation, but we certainly may make a request that you not take certain steps. Or we may certainly ask on the front end, if, if you're gonna conduct a set of interviews, can we get a, can you let us know kind of the who and when so that we can then make an informed decision about whether we may wanna make a stand down request or whether we may ourselves wanna take our own independent steps um, in advance to insulate us from any potential compulsion that could be uh, gleaned from that later on. So, um, so I, I don't know if that's a really satisfactory answer. It, it is the same, but I think that the conversations that we're having on the front end about how we're going to interact with each other and the way in which we document it um, are, are really important. Mike, given that you have been in private practice representing companies yes, in the before and aftermath of these more recent cases where this is coming up, have you seen a change in the relationship that you've had with DOJ when you're representing corporate clients? I, I have. There was a time that prosecutors would tell us, here are the people we want you to interview. Or, you know, I once got a request, when you interview when this customer who is a suspect calls, can you record that call? And, and we said no, because this had already, these cases had already started to, to prop up. I don't get any questions like that anymore. More often I get these sorts of requests, can we not do something? Can we not interview someone or can we not take some investigative step? And, um, and we usually agree to that, although sometimes we can't. And I'm, I'm interested in actually, JP, in your view, when a company says, respectfully, I, I appreciate your request, but we need to know if this guy's a bad guy and we need to fire him or not, or we need to, we have a regulator and we have a reporting obligation or you know, we can't just let him continue to work. Or a disclosure. Know. Yeah. Uh, uh, potentially, right. it could, could be, be a disclosure, disclosure issue obligation. to investors. How do you weigh, you know, the company that says, well, I appreciate your request, but I can't do that? Um, it depends. <laughs> so, I, I mean, 
I think that, uh, I mean, our practice is certainly, um, is just to communicate on these things. And when we make requests, we make them in good faith. And we hope that uh, someone who is seeking cooperation credit is in a position to comply. But, uh, but believe it or not, we do understand that sometimes there's a decision to be made that they can. And how that's going to shake out is probably going to depend on what happens next and down the road. Uh, and so, um, you know, I, the, I, I, I won't and we don't take the hardened position that uh, in the face of any standout request, if you, uh, if you make the decision to do something different, that that is necessarily a ding against you. Uh, but it could be, depending on what happens in the future. But I think one thing that I would always ask of uh, outside counsel that I'm dealing with is if you're going, if you're not going to abide by my stand down request, I appreciate you letting me know so that I, I at least know what's happening. Uh, and then I can go ahead and, and calculate what I'm going to do next, um, whether I'm going to take just sit back or whether I'm going to take some law enforcement step. I think what's so important about this is that it not becomes some kind of, um, with respect to the, what brings us here in terms of compulsion and discovery and whatnot, is that the my request for a stand down and Mike's decision to, to, to decide he's not going to stand down not become a wink and a nod towards uh, directing an investigation. And uh, that is so important. Um, and I think, you know, from, for everyone sitting in the room, this, uh, maybe this is more anecdotal than anything, but I share Sandra's kind of um, uh, jokingly thinking about some of these decisions because it's like if you're on the phone when we're having these conversations, they tend to be a little bit tense when, uh, when I make a stand down request and Mike says, no, we're not gonna stand down. And so the idea that, um, that uh, the subsequent steps become state action are, are comical in many respects. But, um, but I think it's important that we simply communicate and, and understand where we're coming from and see what happens down the road. Why does DOJ feel a, a, a need, because I think this would be, you know, just be helpful generally, to ask companies, if they've got an internal investigation, they've identified two people that they want to go interview. Why the stand down request? What, what does it matter if company counsel interviews an employee before DOJ decides it, you know, it wants to? What does it matter if DOJ comes second? It, it, it depends. Uh, there are a number of different reasons why that may be the case. Um, I think it's, it's factually dependent, it's stage of the litigation dependent. But, but I would stand on one principle um, that I think is important. It, it, it matters in this respect because we are not going to delegate our prosecutorial or our investigative function to a private actor uh, on principle. I mean, I do, you know, believe it or not, we do sit around and have conversations about making sure that like, you know, we are, we are the investigative body here. We are the government. And so sometimes these stand out, I, I don't mean to suggest in any respect that a stand out request is something that's lightly made or simply on some kind of generic principle of like, well, we're the government, so we're going to decide when the interview is done uh, in every respect and on our terms only. But, um, but I think it can depend on the, the facts and circumstances of the case, but also a real uh, belief that um, when we're conducting an investigation, we know the information that we really want to get. We know how best to get it, and we're going to be in the best position to get that if we're the ones that get the first crack. And I would just say, I mean, a couple of things. I mean, a, a slightly sort of more cynical view, and I, I take that view as, as being completely earnest and genuine. But, you know, when I was at the fraud section, we did a ton of work with the um, United Kingdom and particularly the SFO. And they were pre these decisions that may now cause the department to go back to a more aggressive deconfliction stance in order to make sure that they are not, you know, acting independently and not directing any investigation. I mean, what the SFO, and I sat next to David Green and others would say all the time, okay, this was, we don't want anyone to trample our crime scene, essentially. Now, um, that was that was their view. I mean, they would not allow, the, the conversation, um, you know, definitely was not, there was not as reasonable of a response from the SFO that JP offered, um, to your point, Mike, what if we can't, what if we can't 
acquiesced to this request for deconfliction for a whole host of reasons. I mean, and I, I can tell you while at fraud, I mean, we had butted heads with our counterparts um, on um, joint investigate, not you know, technically joint investigations, but investigations that were coordinated um, because of different approaches approaches to that. So, you know, the view is, I think, their view, which was more of a, you know, black and white view, and the view sometimes of some prosecutors, depending on what their experience has been in large cases, is that defense counsel will come in, you know, they're not just, you know, interviewing one person, they're interviewing everybody on the desk. And then all of a sudden, everybody on the desk has the same the same narrative when they do come in and talk to the government. So the government's view is that defense counsel's presence has just resulted in a circling of the wagons and that then the government having to come next and conduct its interviews and its investigation is not getting the the, the real um, reaction to the documents it puts in front of the witness, for example, because they've looked at them and they've been offered potentially plausible explanations by very experienced and savvy defense counsel, et cetera. Um, and if you've seen that a few times when you're working on the government side and that has frustrated the purposes of your investigation or that's how you feel. Um, but that's you exactly what I mean when I say we're just going to do it better if we get the first crack. I mean, I really like the idea of like, don't trample on the, the crime scene. I mean, that is, that is the reality of, of what prompts a lot of these requests. But when you, when you have that request, you ask government, the company counsel, don't go in there and do the interviews. We want to do them first. And then you're taking the interviews. Presumably those people are represented. Someone has already shown them the documents. And it's someone whose right. interest right. is not, we represent the institution. We're trying to get to the truth. We're cooperating. Instead, it's someone whose interest is, I'm your lawyer. I'm defending you. That's how it should be. But I think everybody on both sides of the aisle has experienced our pool council situations, for example, where the representation of the individual is not as zealous as maybe it could be. And, um, but, but you're right, it's, it's not like it's totally, I mean, one of the other things I was gonna say is aside from cross-border, and even in some cross-border situations from the government's perspective, you know, it's, one could say, it's pretty polite of them to ask for deconfliction because you, these are usually all pre-indictment situations where they can go knock on the, the person's door at 6 a.m. Um, with a subpoena or whatever. And, you know, since being on the defense side, I've certainly experienced that in domestic, in cases that involve domestic companies and employees. And I, I was like, well, this is pretty impolite. This is, you know, there were no, you know that we're here or we're involved. Why aren't you going through us? And they're like, well, this is how we're doing it. This is how we're doing it in this case. And um, so I think sometimes we do forget in the corporate context that there are all these traditional law enforcement, especially cross-border ones, all of these traditional law enforcement techniques that, um, are are out there, are available, are ethical under the rules of professional conduct, and and uh, you know with some nuance depending on jurisdiction, and um, so you know that could be the step that the the, the steps that the government maybe should um, or would or could could take. Um, so I know since being on this side, I'm experiencing um, all different variations of it. Um, so. But your, your point's right. Usually it's not it's not like it's in a vacuum. I mean, it could be. They say, deconflict, we'd like you not to interview. And then they go knock on their door at 6 a.m. Well, then maybe they haven't been shown the documents yet. And I guess one one complaint I've heard from the defense bar on the deconfliction issue is sometimes they'll get the stand down request and the government does not move quickly enough to actually interview the person. And, and right. as was pointed out, you know, that can interfere with one's uh, uh, disclosure obligations, obviously the, the board's. Um, uh, duty to to run the the corporation, and then from the attorney standpoint, it it can impact the attorney client relationship because in order to discharge one's duty as an attorney, you need the facts. Um, do you think, in light of um, these recent decisions, that um, it, it will be possible for there to be at least some pushback? from the defense bar um, to require or perhaps more narrowly tailored deconfliction arrangements, maybe a timeline. Don't interview this person before X date. Um, and if we get to that person by then, fine. If not, then, you know, it's fair game for you. Um, do you think that that might be in the offing, given the fact that courts are probably now going to scrutinize this interaction between the government um, um, and uh, and counsel, even on deconfliction? 
Yes, so and I mean, that's, that's already, I think, the scope of these conversations. Typically when, uh, my experience is when, when there's a deconfliction request and then the response is, well, no, we don't really want that, then, then where we end up talking is, can we talk about a time frame? Mm -hmm. And like, can we talk about a, a two week period or whatever it is, a month long period or whatever, um, before some step is taken. And um, so I, I think that this might make it more, that, that the government may be more incentivized under certain circumstances to live with that type of um, compromise. Um, but I, I think that that has um, candidly always been kind of something that, that we're talking about is timeframes and things like that. And part of the issue that has been coming up is when employees who now been indicted are moving to suppress and claiming that the statements they made to company counsel were compelled. And there can sort of be a couple different ways of compulsion. One is that if the employee doesn't speak to company counsel or if the employee says, learns DOJ wants to speak to me and I don't want to speak to DOJ, I have a Fifth Amendment right. Um, what is DOJ doing in terms of discussions with company counsel about whether or not company counsel, the company should be holding the threat of loss of job or cutting off attorney's fees and cutting off indemnification or advancement of fees if an employee doesn't cooperate. How are you, are you guys dealing with that head on? Are you not? Are you getting questions from company counsel? You know, they're gonna be fired if they don't come in. We just want you to know that. And you're gonna, you're gonna, yeah. DOJ's gonna have to live with that. So, uh, so thankfully in, in uh, all candor, I have not had to deal with that, uh, with down, downstream issues like that. Um, the broader one of, you know, just, hey, get your guy in here. And if your guy doesn't come in here, fire him. And if you don't, then um, you're not going to get your cooperation credit. That, that's not the way we handle this. In fact, we, we absolutely don't want that circumstance because then we're going to have a much bigger problem down the road. But, I mean, I think the way we handle it on our end is uh, it's when we deal with, with witnesses, when they are... when when corporate counsel arranges interviews for us, we in the interview itself take steps to make sure that we're comfortable that it is a voluntary interview insofar as uh, a gun is being held to somebody's head or a specific threat of termination is being held over a person to get them in the room with us um, because that that is not acceptable. I think some of these, I've described them as downstream issues. I'm not sure that's exactly right, but like attorney's fees and things like that certainly have not had to deal with that. And um, I'm not gonna kind of weigh in on a department position there, but um, but I think that we are really cautious about tactics that we use um, because one of the things that we just have to live with in any investigation is if somebody doesn't want to talk to us, they never have to. Um, and we have other ways of dealing with that, um, a subpoena um, or what have you. And so I think it's more us utilizing our law enforcement techniques uh, in those circumstances rather than uh, more creative, I'm not sure is the right word, but creative ones. Uh, I would think that, th yeah, I mean, I think since May, yeah, <laughs> right. uh, that's not, ha I mean, I, I, I don't think, and I, my experience was not, you know, ever to tell a company they should be threatening to cut off attorney's fees or something. Right. I mean, that's been, that would be just problematic, whatever. Do I think that in the past, it was some, sometimes maybe not a wink and a nod, but sort of on, on both sides, on both sides, the government and the company, when it came to employment decisions, this like, well, if we were to, what would you think of if we were not to? Well, well we can't tell you what to do, whatever. I mean, that that's a that is a tough one. I mean, it's hard. You can um, companies are in a tough spot on that one, right? I mean, there are um, either you know people and, and agencies, depending on where you are, what jurisdiction, you know, that oversee and that regulate and that would say you must, you must take these sorts of steps, you know, again, we worked with the UK a lot and the FCA would say you, these are the sort of steps that have to be taken. Then there's the issue of, well, we haven't gotten from the government's perspective and we haven't even gotten to interview that person yet. And to the extent there are any obligations that are connected to their employment, not because the government's imposed them, but because that, those are what the employee uh, imposes, well, if they're fired, then they're not going to be in <coughs> these obligations, and then maybe we'll never get to speak to them. 
then there are jurisdictions where the employment rights, um, in my experience, at least like in Germany, way trump, seem to trump any criminal investigator's rights. And that, you know, um, we really, yeah, I won't, I'll, I'll leave that alone. Um, and then there is the government saying, well, we want to know everything that you've done to remediate and, and what, what's going on. You know, why are these people still working here? Wasn't this person the center of it? So there's a lot of tension there and there are a lot of competing things. And I think some of them can be discussed candidly and openly, like we're, we're going to have this disclosure obligation or we've got another regulator in another part of the world that is also focused on this, that is saying this must be taken and there's a timeline this must this action must be taken and there's a timeline for that or you're going to be in violation. Um, uh, uh, there are some of those conversations that can be had candidly, but I think there are some other conversations that were a little bit more um, implicit before in terms of this sort of remedial piece of it that the government, I assume, is um, just not not is the answer is just we can't we don't have an opinion on it. Um, um, unless there's something that the government's willing to share about how it might impact their in investigation. And even then, the company can't really take, take direction about what it's supposed to do. Um, it can take in information and make its own decision. But so since you've been on this side, yeah. since you've switched, mm -hmm. what are the things, given what your experience, you know, you had a front row seat uh, to a couple of these cases, has it given you or changed perspective in terms of when you represent companies or individuals, what you're looking out for, um, how you're best positioning yourself, your client, in a defense posture? Sure. I mean, I think you're looking out for all of the, I mean, look, I haven't been doing it all that long. You know, cases take a long and representations take a long time to develop. So like, when I think of a couple of the things that I'm working on involved in now with corporations that are... I could say are more like stem to ultimately stern. Mm -hmm. I'm definitely only, you know, maybe to the knee, <laughs> I guess at this point. Um, uh, but look, I mean, the, from the government's perspective, I think they say, you know, you've got to, they would say to companies. And so it's what I'm thinking also, like you really need to be strategizing early and often and not not being static about the approach. You know, there's, there's maybe an approach and a conversation that occurs when the CID comes or when the first, the first subpoena comes, but you've got to be nimble and you've got to be reevaluating based upon how the interaction with the government is, is going. Um, and so those are the sorts of things that I'm thinking about. For me, what's been very interesting being on this side is how different some of the, the nature and character of the interactions are with different government agencies. And frankly, that um, some that you might have mentioned earlier that are more, you know, have the civil power are are a much more sort of methodical and inflexible than criminal investigations are. That's been a bit of a, a surprise to me. And so the way to ap approach that and, and the way that I'm trying to think strategically about those is I've realized a bit you know, different than in, in the criminal context. And um, obviously I recognize we're talking about you know, rights against self-incrimination and all of that. It's more applicable to the, the criminal context. But on the criminal side, I like I was saying earlier, I mean, I've experienced so far a bit of the gamut from, OK, you know, you're here, we'll go through you. Here's the subpoena to the, you know, even though they know that, you know, I or the firm is involved, the FBI is knocking at their door. And I'm thinking, well, why? I don't, you know, but I, I understand why. But um, whether that's ultimately effective is is another is another uh, ball of wax. But I think a lot of what's coming out of this is that, you know, both sides really need to forge their own path. And the defense attorneys can't say, look, the best way to get the most amount of cooperation credit is just to, you know, when the government says jump and in this direction and then this person, you know, how high, okay, whatever. And the government is also understanding that even in challenging and, and cross-border matters that it's going to have to really bring all of its own tools to bear and not, um, you know, sit back and accept, just passively accept information. So Roger, you're the company counsel. <laughs> what are the ethics issues that come up? You're representing the company. Mm -hmm. Company mm -hmm. has given you marching orders, full cooperation. Yeah. We cannot, you know, afford an indictment. Mm -hmm. um, what is the best way to position us? <laughs> 
Uh, even though it may involve some bad news for some employees of the company, what's the best way to position the company uh, to get the most favorable deal with DOJ, to get a non-pros, to get DOJ to say there's nothing to see here? So what are the ethics issues that come up? Yeah, you know, I think in, in these situations, and particularly this this great discussion we had about the confliction perhaps coming to the fore, um, it is very important to be crystal clear with people um, you're you're engaging with, and um, certainly um, a number of ethics rules. Four point one truthfulness um, uh, is one that comes um, uh, to mind. Four point three uh, dealing with unrepresented persons, if in fact. Um, uh, you um, have an interviewee who has not yet obtained uh, counsel. You know, 8.4 is always, 8.4C is always um, something um, to keep in mind um, uh, as well. What is 8.4C? 8.4C <laughs> deals with misconduct and that it was dishonesty <laughs> uh, <laughs> and fraud and deceit. Yes. And, and the reason why these are so important is because um, there are likely to be questions, right? If, you know, even the most sophisticated savvy of those you uh, engage with will have questions uh, about their role. I know we, we had a discussion prior to the panel uh, about the dynamics within some organizations when uh, there are, are certain individuals who, you know, for lack of a better term, are being jettisoned uh, in favor of uh, protecting um, the company or, or those in, in um, other places within the company. And so there are going to be lots of, of questions. And in a deconfliction uh, context, you, you may have people who uh, would have expected to, to be interviewed by now, right? You know, I have the same job that she has and she was interviewed. How come they haven't come to see me? And they may come to you as counsel and say, you know, how come I haven't been interviewed? You have to be very careful um, about how you answer that question, both from an ethical standpoint and then also because you perhaps do not want to jeopardize um, your cooperation credit or the credit you're seeking um, uh, from uh, the government. And um, 1.13F is another uh, provision um, when you're dealing with um, uh, constituents of corporations and, 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 you know, in particular employees in this uh, context, being crystal clear about who you represent. And obviously, up John warnings are going to be given, but um, you have ethical duties up over and above um, uh, what uh, up John uh, conveys and being very clear with these individuals and uh, being careful about how you answer questions like, should I get my own lawyer? Um, you know, do you think that would be a good thing for me? Um, uh, particularly when your truthful answer to that question uh, conflicts with your own interest as company counsel. So, yeah. So I found some of the, the hardest questions too that are not not it's not hard to answer ethically, but it's the, the flip side of it. It's in, in representing individuals that maybe that the company is indemnifying for mm -hmm. when they they're still there, they're in the thing of it. They work, they come to work every day, and they say. Well, is the company going to stand behind me, right? And way they, behind you. They answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that is they're like so because the company's paying for you, right? Mm. And yeah, they're paying for this, right? I mean, obviously, they, you know, it's but it's it's tough. They it's hard for them to to comprehend that. Um, and the answer may be right, yes or no. Who knows? Um, they may they just may not, right? So Mike, what, what, what do you do now? So these are good points. Um, and this point about individuals is very important as well. We get people their own lawyers more often than we used to. I have seen a change in relations with the government since May. I, I do a lot of work in the financial institution space and as heavily regulated entities when a financial institution is cooperating, typically many of my clients would take the position that we're cooperating means everybody's cooperating. And that meant if you, the government wanted to talk to you, you were going to talk to them. And if you thought you had a Fifth Amendment right not to talk to them, you're out of here because we don't need anybody who has that issue at the company. Whereas recently, I've gotten explicit requests, both from the SEC and from DOJ, not to tell company employees that they're required to talk to the government. If they don't want to talk to the government, we don't make them anymore. And I think that's to avoid this, this Connolly and Black issue. Um, but we still try to have as open a line of communication as we can, um, keeping in mind the things that JP said uh, about how people take notes are important. We teach associates that like they're, they can't rely on the fact that their notes are always going to be privileged. Uh, 
So I try to teach them to write interview memos the way FBI agents used to write 302s. Mm -hmm. They don't put their thoughts or, or impressions or whatever in the memo. They put that someplace else, just, just as you mentioned. And we try to telegraph to the government what we're doing. We don't ask who should we interview, but we try to tell them who we're interviewing because when we're cooperating, we're, yes, we're cooperating with the government. We're all friends. Hopefully it's not as tense a conversation as it seems to be. <laughs> but we know that the government is not really our friend if we're cooperating with them. They're the tiger in the room. And we'd rather be feeding the tiger in the room than be the food. So <laughs> that's, okay. uh, <laughs> that, that's, that's basically how it, we conduct ourselves. So in both... Um, the cases that we were talking about, the recent cases, Convergex and Deutsche Bank, the companies had entered into deferred prosecution agreements with the government before the government brought indictments against employees. And in both cases, and actually this was true in the Stein case back in 2006 with KPG, they had also entered into a deferred prosecution agreement. In, in each of those cases, one of the factors that the judges looked at to determine whether or not the actions of the company were fairly attributable to DOJ or the CFTC, one of the things they looked at was the fact of the deferred prosecution agreement, because it's essentially a cooperation agreement, and it has the language in there, the provision that says we require continuing cooperation, which means you've got to turn over records to us if we ask for it. Is there going to be any way that DOJ, you think, handles things differently? Does the company want DOJ or the government to handle things differently with these deferred prosecution agreements or even non-prosecution agreements? Because that provision that says we'll turn over anything you want us to turn over that's not privileged becomes very susceptible to an argument that for Rule 16 discovery purposes, what the company has in its files is essentially in the control of DOJ, all they have to do is, you know, pick up the phone and ask, and they get for it. And in other words, if you bring it down to you know your basic sort of, if it's a drug case or a violent crime case, the government signs up a couple of cooperators, right. and if that cooperator is sitting on diaries of all the stuff he did with his co-conspirators, I can't think of many district court judges that aren't going to say, government, this is your cooperator, and you're claiming that's not in your possession, custody, control. So why should companies be treated any differently if they become signed up cooperators with the government? So I'd sort of like to get the government perspective on having that language in there and also, you know, from company counsel's perspective. Um, so I, I can't, I do not anticipate that that language is changing. Uh, that's like a critical part of cooperation, whether it's an individual cooperation or corporate cooperation. I think the, uh, I think the biggest thing about it is, uh, when, when we deal with any, with an entity or with an individual, we are always seeking out all the information, all the evidence that we think we need in order to hold a co-conspirator or in this case, you know, from a corporate to an individual, an individual responsible for their crimes. And what I think is it gets down to where we, uh, I think I started my first comments and how we deal with that and the possibility that we can be tagged with more than we necessarily intended to be tagged with is making very good record of, here's the information that we requested from the company. Here's how we scoped it to try and make our requests reasonable and make the search for that information reasonable. Here are the, the steps that we took to make sure that we were sufficiently broad to get, you know, we had a conversation before walking in here, but about exculpatory information or impeachment material or whatever it is, but that we can demonstrate what we did it, why we did it, and why our search for information was reasonable. And I feel like that's the best we can do under those circumstances. And then we just have to take the litigation as it, as it comes. Um, but uh, our position certainly is not um, by mere virtue of entering into a cooperation agreement with that kind of language, the entity or much less an individual becomes a state actor, but as a, as a practical, or that we get tagged with discovery, but as a practical matter, we take on a little bit of risk with that. And that's why I think it's just, we're making thorough requests for information and we're making good records of how we're scoping those requests and how we're going about our searches, whether it be by record, custodian, location, et cetera. I'm gonna use this, I'm always looking for arguments to turn a DPA into an NPA. 
So maybe this is, you know, I can figure out how to use this somehow. But I think there's a, an opportunity to dial back some of the language that the courts have seized on to say that the company is a government cooperator without really effectively changing your relationship with the government. I don't know that the, the document has to say all of the government's documents are set, can will be turned over upon request if the government can just subpoena them. You know, and at least in the regulated industry space with, with our regulators, the government can just write a letter. And we're never going to say, ah, you know, we're not going to give you that document. So maybe there are ways that we can think about fashioning the same kind of relationship, but not making it so... Uh, so, so simplistic that now the government is um, is your you know the the officer the police officer and your company is your cooperator with the drug ledgers in his basement. So w this doesn't totally solve it, but I can definitely tell you when I was leading fraud, um, and and this was not the case with these two cases that had you know come some years before, but one of the key considerations that we in leadership were thinking about was because, and, it, and of course it was responsive to criticism in the bar at the time, which I think is fair, is what's with these prosecutions or these re resolutions, whether it's an NPA, DPA, whatever, with companies that have no individuals, that, that there are no individuals being prosecuted, right? I mean, because one of the, you know, the company itself, one of the things that it can argue under the Philip factors is, you know, there, there are other mechanisms and ways of, of holding accountable the actual wrongdoers here that may obviate the need to do a resolution with the actual corporate entity. And so there was a move toward A, making sure, and this came from Yates as well, but, you know, A, that it, if there is going to be some sort of prosecution or resolution with a corporation, well, what is it based on and whose conduct is it based on? And are those individuals being accountable? Now, again, the cross-border aspect can throw wrenches in that, but I think that you saw the fraud section was not hesitant to charge people who were overseas, whether or not ultimately they ended up being extradited or prosecuted. And there was, you know, mixed, mixed um, results with some of those prosecutions. But the reason I think that's partially responsive to what we're talking about here is that because at least at that point, there can be records, and you were alluding to this too, and a more formal process of gathering the evidence that is being used to indict those individuals, right? Now, it doesn't mean that the company wasn't cooperating along the way leading up to the date of you know, resolution and indictment, which should hopefully be announced at the same time and not, not two years before with a company and, and two years later then the, calling the company every day as their DPA is running out to get the data that the government needs to prosecute somebody. But I do think there is greater opportunity for the government if they stay on the same timeline, if they have gathered all of the evidence that they believe that they need to pursue and, and have an indictment returned um, and do that at least on the same timeline, the corporate resolution, because I think you'll find there's probably been more of a formal process of, of gathering that evidence, whether subpoena or otherwise. And therefore that was more defensible to a court that's saying, really, the company was just had already gotten the deal it wanted. They were just cooperating and you gathered all of your evidence. The company just provided you with all of their evidence um, because they wanted to make sure that, you know, they weren't breached or something like that. You know, there are still incentives um, leading up to that. But I, to my mind, um, uh, A, I, I believed when I was in the government that it was the right thing to do to not just hold a company accountable and, and, and not do the hard work that it took off to actually, you know, be able to have a, a case that you could put to a jury against an individual rather than just a private contract between the company and the government. So Roger, does this all mean, okay, given what DOJ is now trying to do with making deconfliction requests, actually getting up and doing the investigation and not sitting back and relying on company counsel, does this mean that outsourcing is gonna go down of white collar <laughs> investigations? I, I, I think it will, um, what it will mean uh, is that ultimately uh, uh, corporate counsel, outside counsel, and the government will um, find a, a new equilibrium where um, cooperation can be uh, demonstrated conclusively, 
um, and the government gets what it needs, but it's not specifically directing the investigation. And, and whether that is um, a situation where the general guidelines that we find in these various DAG memoranda um, are made even clearer, again, generally, so that you don't have to direct um, specific actions um, in individual uh, cases. Um, if it is a sort of a culture shift within the, the criminal defense bar, as, as Mike um, uh, you know, mentioned, uh, telling the government what you're going to do for them and feeding the tiger so that you don't become tiger food yourself. I like that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that. Um, uh, but I, I think there, there will be a culture shift um, uh, because ultimately the, the government uh, is still going to need to rely on these sorts of investigations to, to get at the information um, it needs to enforce um, uh, these laws. And these companies are still going to want the Operation credit um, that they that they see. Okay. Any questions? Ron, how are you? It's fine. That was my question. It's good to see you. <laughs> um, so when we drafted the monitor standards, we uh, concerned about the whole issue of state action. Um, is the analysis that has gone on for the last half uh, hour and a half? essentially the same for monitors and private inspectors general, or do uh, you think it differs in some way? Well, I'll say in, in my paper, I am I am trying to, to draw distinctions among um, those contexts. I, so I'd love to talk to you offline uh, about some ideas I have about how one might distinguish um, these independent uh, corporate monitors um, from the internal investigation um, uh, context. And the, the independent IG context is another one that I'm seeking to explore uh, as well. The bar is open in two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Would the government enter into agreements with the company about what the cooperation entails to start with? No. <laughs> Why not? Uh, so that's what I mean. I don't mean to be that fresh about it, but, but 
that's not, those are not agreements that the government enters into with individuals either for, for a variety of reasons, because it, it can have a, a, just a terrible impact on the type of information that we obtain and the credibility of that information, the way it would be viewed later on uh, by a jury. It, it also, I think, could prompt many of the concerns that we, we started with right here, that it is in fact the government that's trying to compel this information uh, from individuals. So um, no, but, but I think to your point, I think you raise a good point, and that's where the communication is so important and that we are documenting what our requests are and, uh, and uh, in an appropriate fashion, why we're, why we're making those requests and how we're scoping our, our searches for information. Right, and also another thing is that and there's some circumstances, as you mentioned before, that prior to cooperate with the government, the company itself already proceed with the investigation. So when is the government's role coming to this? You know, you, you probably want to differentiate that. So that later on, if really something happens, um, that could be the individual brought the amendment issues, the constitutional issues, then you know how can, from the government's perspective, then you know how, from where you can limit the discovery, the thing that they can, they can, dis, they can be discovered because the government's participation. So, yeah, that, I, that's the, I, I, idealistic. And I think, I mean, my experience of the government is sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't because there's more, often more parties or more cooks in the kitchen, as you say, including other regulators that, that you know, at least like in the UK, that even though you're sitting down over a cup of tea to ask questions, it's considered compelled in their jurisdiction. Okay. And then that has implications that flow um, and, and, and roll downhill and um, things that um, even if, if the government tries, it, it's hardest to sort of limit and anticipate. You can't always anticipate and you can't ask other regulators always. You can't control the steps that they're taking and, and when they're taking them. So what you're saying is, is would be great if it could happen in practice at all times, but I think the realities are often more complicated in terms of the number of players that are involved. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.